So hi, I'm Helena. I work with the Open Infra Foundation and I work for the foundation on behalf, or I manage all the user groups on behalf of the foundation. One of those being the Canada user groups. I'm in Texas, so I manage those ones a lot more heavily by putting on meetups and stuff here. And then I assist with any other user groups who are trying to put on meetups or open in for days and helping them find sponsorships, speakers, that kind of stuff, marketing, promotion, whatnot. Um, so for our agenda today, we're first off, welcome message. Hi, I'm Helena. We've been there, done this already. Um, and then after that, I'm going to hand it over to Bruce from Wind River, who will do an introduction to the Starling X project. And then on to Bruno with Encora, who will do a uh, navigating, or, sorry, navigating Starling X, a practical guide to the community contributions and, uh, whoops, sorry, oh, I can't go back. Oh, yes, so then I'll hand it to Bruno, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, the next thing is, uh, we're just four weeks away from the Open Infra Summit uh, that's happening in Canada and Vancouver and registration is still on for that. And the Starling X project will be heavily represented at the summit. Um, we'll have representatives from Wind River, Encora, and Os Osnabrück University in Germany who all have sessions going on. On the right side of the screen, you can see the agenda that includes all the Starling X talks. Included in there is the Starling X hands-on workshop. So if you're new to the project and want to learn how to get started in it, this is a good place to start. Uh, there is an RSVP list for that hands-on workshop, just to keep in mind to make sure you put your name on that list. However, it is included in your summit ticket. It's not a separate purchase or anything. And also the Starling X community will be meeting at the PTG, which will be on site at the summit. Um, as I mentioned, we will have Wind River present at the summit, so you, there are headline sponsor and you can go visit their booth and talk to some of the folks from there to learn more about Starling X as well. The other thing going on is this year we will be featuring a hiring event, so if you're looking for a new career in open source technology, we have all these companies and more who will be there ready to talk to you about your career in open source technology. And that's all I had in terms of community updates. I'll drop a couple links in the chat for some of the things I talked about if you're interested, including the link to the Starling X project website. Um, and I'll hand it on over to Bruce. Thank you. Let me find the screen sharing button. So my name is Bruce Jones. Um, I was one of the original founders of the Starling X project. I was uh, project manager for the project before we even came up with the name of Starling X and uh, worked on it for a while, had the privilege of serving on the technical steering committee. And then Intel's priorities changed and I can talk about that a little bit if there's interest in that and I moved on to other things. And as a perfect example of why you should never burn a bridge in the industry, I'm now back working on the Starling X community again and very glad to be here. Um, we're here celebrating the fifth anniversary of the project this year, which is pretty cool. One of the questions, and this actually, this was a very urgent issue back in the day. Um, why is this called Starling X? Where did we get that name? And um, we had planned to call it something else and our plans changed drastically at the last minute. And one of our executives said, well, starlings do this cool thing called murmuration, where the huge flock of birds um, moves as one without any communication, without any coordination between the birds. They just automatically somehow know where to go. And they're the only birds that do that. So we decided to name the pro project after these cool birds. And we put an X on the name because at the time, all the cool edge related projects had an X on their name. So, you know, we wanted to make sure people understood that we were, you know, edgy and, and cool. So what Starling X is, and I'll talk about a little bit how we got here, is a complete stack of everything you need to deploy um, systems at scale at the edge, manage those systems at the edge, manage the workloads at the edge. Um, it comes with the Yocto kernel, 
A lot of our users today are using uh, real-time operating systems for ultra high performance. We have a set of our own services that run on the platform. We deploy Kubernetes, and then we deploy containerized versions of OpenStack services should you decide uh, that you'd like to run both Kubernetes and OpenStack workloads. Um, the goals here are to keep the system you know, easy to manage, although it is a big complex system, so easy management is relative. We want to try to automate everything that happens. I'll talk about some examples of some of the automation in a minute. And you know, we, we've uh, taken the project from an open source project to, um, to being deployed on major networks of major service providers in the world. If your phone is on Verizon, there's a pretty good chance that your call is being routed through nodes that are running Starling X. And I just switched my phone to Verizon so I could say that I support our customer. Um, we started the project in October of 2018. Uh, at the time, it was uh, entirely OpenStack based on bare metal. Um, the second release of the project, we moved um, to Kubernetes on bare metal with uh, containerized OpenStack on top. Um, the following releases, we were doing two releases a year. We, we try to follow the open infrastructure, open stack release model, but we don't necessarily try to align with the cadence. So we just try to release twice a year to the community. And um, the folks at Wind River at the time were very focused on the telco edge. Um, on the Intel side, where I was working at this time, we were talking to a number of big industrial customers. And what we found out was that um, Intel's not in the right business to service software to big industrial customers. So um, while Starling was very, very compelling as a solution, and I, we have quotes from some of the executives at some of these big, enormous companies that I'm sure you've heard of, um, because Intel was not in the software business and could not and would not sign long-term support contracts, um, we found that our customers were adopting other solutions. And so over time, uh, Intel chose to wind down their investments on the project. Now, there are still Intel people working on uh, Starling X, but they're working down at uh, the network level for the most part of network drivers and helping us adopt the Intel operators uh, for high performance networking in uh, for our customers use cases. I'm going to stop. Are there any questions from anybody here? It's all perfectly sensible. Bruno's nodding his head. So thank you, Bruno. So there's a lot of different ways to deploy um, Starling X today. Um, it all starts by picking up a pre-built um, ISO image um, from the community, which they're all published, all the release images are out there and published and available. And you simply boot that up on the system that you want to be controller zero. And you tell that system then, well, I want to just run on this one system. And then all of the control functions, all of the services, all of the storage, all of the workloads will all run in this configuration that we call all-in-one simplex. So it's one server, every single function of the entire stack is running. You can also, when you deploy on that first controller, you can say, well, I want to do um, a high availability deployment. I have two systems, so I'll have two controllers. I'll split the storage and the workers between them. However, the current architecture for the HA deployment is active standby. So really the high availability solution is when the desire is for um, High, high, a very high degree of availability and software and hardware redundancy and not because you want twice the amount of computing resources because you're only really running on one of the systems at a time. Uh, the third configuration is what we call a standard configuration 
that is multiple control nodes, as many storage nodes as you would like to have, and then as many worker nodes as your network and computing resources can provide you. And this is a typical private cloud kind of environment. But the really interesting case, and the one that we as the community work on the most is the distributed edge. So in the distributed edge deployment, you can have one um, central cloud, which could be any kind of, of the three deployments. And then you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, other distributed edge nodes that could also be any one of the other deployments. So if you wanted to deploy a thousand um, simplex systems to sit at the base of your cell phone towers, you can do that. And if you wanted to deploy all kinds of, um, public, of private clouds using a large standard configuration, you could do that as well. And you can manage all of those systems from one dashboard. You can push software updates to all of those systems from one dashboard to you can see alarms and logs from all of those systems. And the other interesting thing is, since each of those edge nodes is itself a full deployment, if connectivity between the central cloud and the edge is lost, um, the work continues. You still have Kubernetes, you still have your OpenStack services, all your other platform level services continue to run on the edge node you can't manage or change anything from the central cloud until connectivity is restored. But this is a very robust solution, and we find that a lot of our users are very interested in it. So I mentioned um, Verizon is a customer. Um, these are commercial customers, um, but they are using you know 100% Starling X uh, software in these deployments. Um, and there's three of the biggest telephone companies on the planet right now have active production deployments of Starling X. There are other use cases we've looked at. Um, in my time at Intel, I sp spent a lot of time talking to industrial teams. There's some capabilities of Starling that are very interesting there. In particular, the real-time kernel is very interesting. The other interesting thing about Starling is that the footprint on the nodes is very small. So all of the services, everything that, that needs to run to allow the platform to operate and manage can run today on two cores of a, of a platform. And we're working very hard to get that down to one core. Um, now the big, huge Sapphire Rapids core um, that are not, they're not cheap, but everything you need to operate your uh, distributed edge nodes can run on one core of one Sapphire Rapids machine. So the, the overhead for the system at runtime is relatively small. So I didn't know this was a build out slide. I'm just gonna build the whole thing out. Um, what we see right now is that the, the telcos are very far into their deployment of applications with containers and Kubernetes, and none of the current users, uh, the big commercial users of Starling are uh, running OpenStack at this time. However, they are scaling out to some pretty large numbers. So um, we, we have, um, you know, talking to users who are planning on deploying uh, 50,000 RUs, which is a radio unit, something again that sits at the bottom of the cell phone tower and they'll be managing that with a number of central clouds. You know, and as I mentioned earlier, everything you, you do needs to be completely automated. So all of the provisioning is zero touch. It all depends on um, connectivity over the IPMI or a BMC bus. So we're really kind of um, leveraging server class hardware here. Um, it is possible to run uh, Starling on smaller platforms without uh, BMC. We did that while we were at Intel. I don't know if that's still supported today. Bruno may know the answer to that. So a couple, well, couple of the things happened in the past that I think we're, I want to highlight here is really, really cool changes that happened. Um, the original version of 
Starling that we released in 2018 was essentially a giant fork of CentOS. And the community worked really, really hard to get rid of the forks so that there's no more carried patches. Um, there was a huge effort early in the community to get the patches down from 1,400 to today. I think I can count the number of patches we carry on the fingers of one hand. And the other thing that happened was that um, we moved the software uh, from a CentOS user space to a Debian user space. So we're using Debian uh, for user space in the operating system. We're using um, Debian images in our containers. You know, of course, most of our containers we just take from upstream projects, but where we have to build containers, we just use Debian. Again, we're using a Yocto kernel because it has excellent support for the real-time kernel. Um, and the transition from Debian is something we tried to do to Debian. We tried to do while we were at Intel. It was very, very challenging. And uh, my hat's off to the team and kudos for them for managing the transition from CentOS, which is end of life a few years ago, to Debian, you know, a fully featured, fully functional um, well-supported operating system in just about two years. It's a huge accomplishment. So what we're doing next, um, we're working on planning for the next release. Um, this is the link to the PTG, which has a link in it to the spreadsheet we're using to talk about all the features we're planning. As I mentioned earlier, we're following the uh, open infrastructure slash open stack development methodology. Um, we're not following the cadence. Um, we didn't, you know, we wanted to um, make our own way, I guess, um, as a community. Um, we declared milestone one for Starling X9 in April. We expect to declare milestone two in the next couple of weeks. And we invite anyone who's in Vancouver at the summit to come find us and talk to us. We'd love to hear from you all. And just a last page, um, if you want to communicate with us, um, we do have an IRC server, server and a presence there. I don't think there's a lot of people using that anymore. Um, I think uh, the best way to reach us and the Starling X project is through the mailing list, which we all in, in the community get. We also um, hold weekly Zoom calls um, for the overall project, for the technical steering committee, and for uh, some of the sub projects. Uh, we'd love to hear from you all um, at any time. At any questions, um, please reach out to us. And and that's all I had, Helena. Hey, Bruce. Hey, Steve. Yeah, I'm not gonna let you out that easy. So, can we go? Can we go back? To, we we you talked about. Um, you know, Starling X and its intersection with Telco, right? And you kind of, you had the one slide showing the other uh, mm -hmm. use cases. Um, is there anything preventing or, you know, are there insights into what it would take to adopt Starling X into any of those other boxes? You know, it, what what's the state of Starling X relative to those? And if, if anybody listening today or in the future, you know, has a has a video use case or, uh, you know, a medical use case, you know, what's 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 uh, the potential intersection of using Starling X for them? I think that, um, I mean, obviously, um, there's a couple of things that I think, frankly, shouldn't be on this chart. Um, autonomous vehicles and drones, in particular. Um, if you're a Starling X worker node and you suddenly go off the network, um, we're just going to think you're down, right? Um, we can't reach you, then you're gone, and we're sorry, you know. So um, we we rely on um, uh, not only constant connectivity but relatively high speed connectivity. Um, the services, um, Kubernetes, OpenStack, our own services are all generating heartbeats and reaching out to each other. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm okay, yeah, I'm okay, yeah, I'm okay. All of that, you know, stuff. I think that um, for me, the since I spent, you know, two years working with industrial customers, 
that that would be one of the ideal places to go. Um, they're hungry for the kind of performance that we offer. Um, they're an extremely conservative industry, so the telcos are moving very rapidly in modernizing their infrastructure. The industrial ecosystem, the, the companies that I talk to, realized that they needed to upgrade their infrastructure. They needed to move to a software-defined infrastructure world, but they weren't sure how to get there. And I think a, a solution like Starling that is fully integrated, um, contains an enormous number of features, um, could be a good way to start those conversations with, with those industrial customers. So then it would be fair that, you know, th this matrix that we're looking at probably, you know, is more is, is as much a thought potential potential thought exercise as anything. But the big takeaway would, might be that there are use cases for Starling X outside of telco, and telco is kind of where it all started. Is that fair? I think I think I think it's safe to say that the telco industry has moved the most aggressively towards software defined infrastructure and they've created, you know, hundreds of standards and, and layers in their software. Um, some of these other industries haven't reached that point yet where they're really embracing software defined e infrastructure. Now everyone's using the cloud, but we're talking about edge computing here and in particular high performance, highly deterministic edge computing which makes thing again makes things like industrial or medical um, very interesting. What we're not talking about is tiny little devices with one small processor and eight kilobytes of memory. Right, this is still a you know you would need a you know, core i five with a decent amount of memory as a worker note here, for instance. Okay, Steve, anything else? No, other than looks like somebody else has a question for you. Oh, perfect. Um, I'll turn it over to Elena to <laughs> moderate that. You have a question in the chat asking what's the difference between the Starling X project and the Airship project? So I haven't looked at Airship in a couple of years, but my understanding is that they are solving a very different problem, but I don't want to speak for the Airship community. If someone else here uh, is more familiar with Airship. I do know that Starling uses components from Airship, um, in particular the Armada component, but we're in the process of replacing that with uh, Flux CD. Okay, sorry I can't answer the question. No worries. Well, are there any other questions for Bruce or? Otherwise we can hand it on over to Bruno to continue on with his part of the presentation. Sure. Oh gosh, how many windows? Which one do I want? Here it is. That's the one. Uh, what are you seeing exactly? Yep, we can see your first slide. The... Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everybody. My name is Bruno. Uh, and on the other side of the scale, uh, I work with Starling X for a little bit more than one month now. Uh, so very different from Bruce, which is here since the beginning. So, in so... progress. Okay, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, quite on the other side of the scale here, and which is fun, I think. And uh, I also think that uh, what I planned for today will complement uh, what Bruce was talking about. 
but my idea, even being a very uh, new member to the community, is I kind of put together all the things that I think I wanted to hear on my first hour of Starling X, let's say. But it, it took me uh, uh, one month to get uh, all those things together for for various various reasons. Not only uh, is not a lack of documentation on or anything. It's just he, real life. It's just how it is. Uh, uh, it takes time for you to to get to to the things and to the correct channels and to do the things that you should be doing when you join the community. So that's why I put this together. And this is the agenda for the presentations. Quite simple here. Uh, this one is the first slide here is just a set of links that I think should be uh, your go-to links whenever you need something from the community. And then I will talk about how to start as a contributor, as a developer. Uh, then I will pause this a little bit and talk about navigating the community itself. Uh, I will talk uh, about the channels that Bruce mentioned, uh, where you look for help and things like that. Then I will go back and talk again more about how to contribute with the community. And then briefly talk about installation and the Tina and Cora that I'm working with. Uh, so I'm not alone. Um, all the things that I'm doing here, we are doing as a team of five currently. Okay. Oh, and by the way, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you uh, need any uh, clarification or if you want to ask a question. So we have a small audience. It's it's fine. Okay. So this is the product website. Obviously, this should be here. But also, more importantly, this is the documentation. Uh, here, I think there is there's everything is here. Everything is in the this documentation website. I am uh, I like very much that there is a team dedicated to the documentation. This is very important. Documentation is a form of com of communication and communicating is very important on a open source community like this one. Uh, Meetings, uh, okay, the community works around meetings. So here's a link for the meetings and we'll be talking about uh, more about them uh, a couple of slides down. Uh, there is a code of conduct. This is how the community expects everyone to, to, to behave, uh, I think. And there is a bug tracker. Uh, it uses Launchpad. Uh, everyone is encouraged to open bugs, uh, report bugs to the community, uh, and and even work on them. I will be showing how to do that very quickly. But uh, I think uh, this is a place to to report a problem that you found. If you have questions, there are other places. I'm going to show you that. The storyboard is a nice place if you have to keep track of uh, like a work that takes, uh, that has several tasks to be accomplished. Right now, my team, for example, is working on one storyboard, one story uh, that was, I think it's there since the beginning of the project. Now that I know the timeline from Bruce's presentation, uh, by the way, uh, if you put Bruce's presentation with mine here, I think that's the the a great way to start here uh, with the community. I, I, I'm enjoying this this meetup here. And the repositories are at opendevorg slash starlingx. And uh, there is the code submission guidelines. This is also lots of words. Uh, the code submission is built on top. The code uh, submission guidelines is built on top of OpenStack uh, code submission guidelines. And so it's going to take you right to, to that right at the beginning. But it's a very good read and a very important thing to read if you plan to contribute with the community. Okay, uh, how do you start as a contributor? If you are a developer like myself, you're gonna go to the repositories. And what happens, uh, if, I, if I saw that list of links that I showed you, I would click on the repositories, the first one. And then you would see a list of 
60 repositories. Uh, it's four pages, 15 uh, repositories each. So it's a lot. Where do you, where, where do you actually start uh, after seeing that? Well, and this is a thing that I found two days ago. Uh, there is a neat, very neat little page here uh, with the list of Starling X projects. Uh, the link is up here. Uh, but what, what it's showing here, I, I would say projects slash teams. Uh, but this is a very, uh, a very uh, small list compared to the list of 60 repositories, right? It's like 10 or 12 teams here, uh, which is way easier to, to navigate. Um, and one thing that I, I, I even have a note here is I, I think it's better to, to kind of make sense of the community around the teams that work uh, in the community, how the community organizes itself. So that's a, uh, a very nice uh, way or very, very nice place to start. So here, for example, if I go to the first thing here, I start to find very interesting things. Uh, I start to see names. So now I know uh, who is responsible for this thing if I need to reach out to, to someone. And uh, more importantly, now I know uh, all the repositories that this thing is responsible for, which is even better. I myself have uh, interest in the Starling X slash tools repository here. So what do I do? Do I, do I email Scott uh, and say, hey, Scott, how are you? Uh, I need help. <laughs> Come on, help me. No, I don't think that's the way to go. Uh, so that's why I'm going to pause a little bit and we are going to talk, to talk about navigating the community itself and all the communication tools that are available for someone at the community. And starting with the weekly meetings, Bruce mentioned the weekly meetings uh, briefly in his presentation. There is a lot again, but don't worry, you don't need to attend to all the meetings all the time of course, but it's important that they are there because every team has its own meeting. Uh, sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's bi-weekly here. For example, the build team that I was showing before, uh, it's a bi-weekly meeting at 7.30 a.m. Pacific. Cool, now I know where to go uh, if I need assistance. I don't need to email uh, Scott. Uh, I can just go attend the meeting uh, and that's good. I'm gonna know what this thing is working on right now. If I if I have a review that needs uh, to be reviewed, I can just go there. And I think the most important meeting within the community is this weekly community call here that happens on Wednesdays. It's every Wednesday, but at the first Wednesday of every month is 12 hours later. So it's two ways, 2 p.m. UTC every Wednesday and it's 2 a.m. UTC on every first Wednesday of the month to accommodate APAC region more easily. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, all the meetings that you can attend to, but that's where you will be able to find people to talk to and they will be able to help you as soon as possible. It's the easiest way to get help, I think. Uh, but there is also the mailing list, like Bruce mentioned. Uh, uh, it is encouraged that we use the list to discuss technical questions. Uh, uh, I mean, the list is called Starting X Discuss. So discuss, uh, it makes sense. Sorry, just a sec. And as Bruce said, the mailing list is the best place to reach everybody on the community. So like I said, you don't need to attend every meeting. Uh, so the mailing list is the best place where you will be able to find everybody. Everybody will uh, receive your message and be able to respond. There is also the IRC. I call it IRC. Sorry if I say that for <laughs> in the middle of the presentation here. Um, so uh, yeah, like Bruce said, 
I don't see many people there. These screenshots like from two days ago, probably when I put this together. And yeah, I was there talking to people, but I knew maybe that's why I was there. But yeah, I think everybody uh, at some point uh, is there. Uh, maybe it's not as synchronous as I wish it was, uh, but it is the place if you need help in, in, in a synchronous communication. And if you need synchronous communication, it's the best place to go right now. Uh, and uh, I think that etherpads are also a communication tool in the community. And this table here that you see on the right is the same uh, table that lists the meetings, uh, but this is the, the, the right side of it. And here you can see the link for all the, the, the calls uh, if you want to attend, but also all the links to the etherpads. It's a great tool for uh, synchronous collaboration as well. Uh, and you have the history of the whole thing, I think, this, you probably have the history of the of five years ago in the etherpads of the community. So everything is there. Another great tool to communicate with everybody in the community. Okay, and I personally uh, uh, added this here because I think uh, knowing how to ask for help is very important in the community. Knowing how to talk to people, uh, even if English is not your first language, which is the case here, you need to be able to communicate with people. So asking for help, which is very common, uh, I, I kind of put together a few hints that I like here to, to follow. First, introduce the problem in detail. Uh, sometimes it's important to say, I don't know, I have a problem in a controller which is running on a virtual box machine that's, uh, I don't know, on a uh, Ubuntu server, whatever. Uh, all the details, they matter uh, for someone that, uh, need, that wants to help you. And uh, also proofread everything that you, all your explanation, because I do that all the time. Uh, I take, it, it takes, I'm a slow reader. It takes like 10 minutes for me to read something that I just wrote. But uh, more often than not, I find the solution by proofreading what I just wrote. It's like rubber duck debugging. Uh, I, I read it and, oh, that's, that might be the problem. Let me see before I send. And then I, I, I kind of end up uh, solving my own problem. So introducing the problem in detail and then proofreading reading what you just wrote helps a lot. And finally, respond to feedback. If people want to help, people often want to help. I love to help everybody to get things done. Uh, uh, and I'm new to the community, so I'm all excited about everything that's related to Starling X. Uh, it's important to respond to feedback. Even if you don't know how to answer, acknowledge the question and maybe say, I don't know how to answer that. Maybe can you help me to answer? the question, this will help people to understand the level of knowledge that you have and will help people to help you. And if this is familiar, it's because I kind of uh, got it from the very famous Stack Overflows, how do I ask a good question? So uh, it's loosely based on that. And also this is a good time has any actually to remind of the code of conduct in the community. I took the six more important things there. Be friendly, patient, and welcoming. Be considerate, be respectful, collaborate openly. When in, we disagree, try to understand why. And when we are unsure, we ask for help. So collaborate openly, I think it's very important. When, when you have a problem, it's probably going to be a problem for someone else two months from now. And if you collaborate, if you ask questions on uh, the mail list, for example, there is an archive, people can go there and find the problem, but the problems, solve the problems by themselves. It helps a lot. Cool. Uh, so I think we know uh, how to get help now, we know where to find people. Uh, we know how to ask questions if we have. Uh, let's finally dive into the repositories. So it's uh, recapping. I was uh, here at the build 
uh, project taking a look that Scott is the one to contact if I need and he's responsible for his team he and his team uh, are responsible for the tools repository I just go there and like any other tool uh, like GitHub or GitLab you just copy the URL go to your machine and clone that repository boom it's there Right, quite easy. Don't need passwords or anything. It's an open source project, fine. If everything that you need is just maybe uh, take a look at the code to make sure that, uh, or, or maybe to validate that you have a bug, you, you want to take a look and understand what why, what's happening. Uh, that's all you need. That's everything that you need to, to get access to the code. In, in this case, the, the tools repository. Uh, but if you are ready to contribute, if you are ready to like fix a bug that you just found and you created that bug on Launchpad, like I mentioned before, uh, you're going to need the uh, Ubuntu One account. So you go to login.ubuntu.com, you create your own account. It's quite easy, email, name, username and password. Uh, I think that's everything. Um, and right after that, you're going to have an opportunity to upload your SSH key, the public part of your SSH key. This is important because this is going to authenticate you uh, uh, when you push changes to, to the repository, to Garrett, which is the tool uh, used to, to do the code reviews. I'm going to be showing right now. Um, OK, you have your account now. You have the repository. Now I am on the repository here under tools. I uh, There's one more thing to do, which is basically install git review. Git review is a subcommand of git, uh, which will help you to submit your changes to Garrett, the code review tool. Uh, after installing, there is one very tiny little configuration that you need to do. I did it globally. Uh, so you have to set up your git review dot username property to the same username that you used on your account when you created in Ubuntu One. And then finally, once per repository that you're going to set up, you run a, a this command here, git review dash s. I think it's dash dash setup. It's probably the same. Uh, this is going to basically create a new remote uh, on your local repository to track uh, the Garrett repository that's used for reviews. Okay, um, you were ready to rock? Oh, uh, before that. Uh, I am a curious person. Uh, if you are, I put this link here. Uh, I don't know how Git review works. I, I, I don't know much of what it's doing behind uh, under the hood. And I do like to know what it's doing, especially when it comes to Git. Git is fun, it's useful, but sometimes it's complicated. So I do like to to understand everything that's happening under the hood. And that's why this, I, I do have a note here, physical post-it somewhere on the mess that is my desk right now with this link here, because that's something I will be checking in the coming weeks. Uh, cool, if you're curious, you also now have the link for yourself. Okay, you are ready to develop. You do the same way you would do with any other Git repository. You create a feature branch, you work on it, you add uh, new files and etc. and you push the files, uh, you add the files, you create a commit on your branch, dash dash all. Uh, yeah, forget about that. I was being silly, I guess. Uh, uh, when you to a git commit, a very important thing here is this dash dash sign off parameter here. Uh, what's going to happen is that this is going to add the line number four here that you see. It's, this is basically saying that the code that you are submitting 
uh, that you agree that the code you are submitting is subject to the same licensing that the project uses. So that's why you have the, the sign off by here. And this is using your name and email set up in Git to put this here for you. And the other important thing here, very important, is this change ID here. This is uh, when we install Git review uh, in the last slide. Uh, this, uh, I think it's when you set up, when you do git review dash dash setup, it creates a git hook for you. So every time that you create a new commit uh, without a change ID, ID, it's going to add an ID for you here. And this ID is going to be used to match, uh, to tie together your change, this commit to a review. And then you run git review and it does the magic, like I said, I I, I want to inspect the code and understand everything that's happening, but I, I didn't do that uh, yet. Uh, but you get a review uh, on Garrett. This is the code review tool. And, and oh my God, there, there is a lot going on here. Uh, there is a lot of things. And I think the first time I, I th that might be the, the, the question that everybody coming from another tool like GitHub or GitLab might have is what's going on here? So uh, I did that for myself and I, I, I kind of wanted to, to share with you here is uh, how do you, you see a Garrett review here is just the same as a GitHub pull request or a GitLab merge request is, is, pretty much the same. It's something that you want to submit to a repository and with your changes and information about it. It's basically it. It's sometimes complicated because you want to review. Uh, can you review my review or something like that? So I, I've seen people call it GCRs, Garrett code reviews on some places uh, that might be specific to some companies. I don't know, but that's uh, what I, I have seen so far. And then uh, one key difference uh, is that uh, commits in a pull request in Garrett are actually patch sets in a review. So if you see right here, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer. Okay, great. Thank you, Elena. Uh, you, you see here, this review in particular is on patch set five. That means that people committed to it five times. Uh, and then you can easily compare here uh, any version of your uh, review uh, with the base branch or even among it, uh, themselves. It's quite useful. It has all the tools that you expect. You can expand here to see the code side by side, unified the way you prefer. Uh, there is a very neat little thing here, which is this change log down here. This is very, very useful because it's all the history. It's all in one place. Like I said, at first I was like, oh, that's too much. But now I'm really comfortable with it. And I think it's honestly, I, I feel it's way better than, than, than GitHub at this point. Let's see if this stands. <laughs> I don't know. For now, it's like that. Uh, and yeah, uh, another very important thing, uh, approvals in GitHub uh, here are plus ones and plus twos. Uh, plus ones, uh, plus twos you only get from core reviewers from that repository. And you need two plus twos. Naming is hard. Review a review and two plus twos to get your review merged. Uh, yeah. Kind of funny to say, especially not being a native English speaker. Uh, but yeah, you need two plus two to get your review submitted, merged, um, and going uh, ahead. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, if if someone says that you need to change something, suggests a change, or say this is this is wrong, please redo or add a comment. Whatever the change you 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 need to do. Uh, in GitHub, you would uh, go to your local branch, create a new commit, and then submit, uh, like sync your local branch with uh, the remote branch. Uh, and that's going to show up as a new commit in the remote branch in GitHub. Here, you amend the existing commit. 
you don't change that change ID that I uh, showed you before. That's very important. And when you submit to Garrett with uh, Git review, uh, Garrett will create a new patch set with the, the difference with that new commit. And like I said, you can compare them here, but you can kind of map commits to patch sets here when you are seeing a review. Cool. Um, oh yeah, uh, what happens after? Uh, I still don't know. I don't, uh, oh, actually, I think one of our reviews were merged in the docs repository so far, uh, but we have like four reviews opened uh, right now. And what happens after is that this is the process that I just described basically. And this is taken from the documentation uh, from, with all the links that I gave you at the, for, uh, the beginning of the presentation, uh, you're gonna be able to find this, this uh, image somewhere. Uh, this is the process that I just described. What happens after is that uh, your change goes to a gate queue and then it's tested and then it's finally uh, on the master branch of the repository, ready to be released, ready to be used when a new release comes. Cool. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, I have a note for myself on this slide here, say improvise. <laughs> I remember why I put this here. Uh, those are uh, here you can see all the mess that uh, me and my team, mostly myself, uh, we've been doing uh, with the reviews. And that's why I put this together <laughs> because it takes some time for you to get used to it, but once once that's done, and if you follow everything that I told you here, you're not going to have the same problems. But you see some aband abandoned changes here. That's why we were getting to know the things. So that's, I'm sorry, community, for that. I'm sorry. But yeah, <laughs> there's four reviews right now open. I think that's a fifth from this week already uh, underway. But the most important thing here is that uh, you can see there is a metric for the size of reviews. Try to keep them small or medium. Keep them small or medium. It's very important. It's easier for reviewers to get uh, your code reviewed if they are very small when focused on only one thing. Sometimes it's not possible. And sorry again, community, there is a very big one here, X large, extra large. Uh, it's because in this case, we are enabling a linter for a whole Python module. So, uh, and, and the code that we are touching is from 2019 and it hasn't been touched since. So there is a lot code, code rots if you don't maintain code rots. So there's a lot of things to, to, to kind of comment, add comments and small fixes. So it's a whole list of changes, but at least we kept focused on only activating PyLint for that uh, module. So uh, it's large, but it's simple changes. And try to keep uh, your changes small, maybe medium. Cool. Um, yeah, that's developing. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the installation process, which was the first thing that I did after reading uh, the, the main website and uh, a big portion of the documentation. Uh, if you look at the documentation website, quite easy to reach on the installation guides here, currently release, and then you go to this very first installation method here. Uh, uh, Bruce mentioned is one of the, uh, this is the all-in-one simplex, meaning everything is running on one machine. And simplex means that there is only one controller. There is no high availability of any sort happening here. If you go there, it's not very hard to follow, uh, but there are many words that maybe you still don't know at this point. Uh, which is which is fine if you are starting with the community. Uh, I'm okay with not knowing some of them. Now I know, but back then I didn't know. And uh, things like simplex controllers, storage, virtual, bare metal, uh, Ceph, 
uh, whatever, everything that's mentioned in the, the, the documentation does a great job of pointing you to the right page where you need to configure some, some things. Uh, but sometimes it's just too much for whoever, for, for someone who is starting. So basically what we did was uh, bring back to life something that was already on the on the project on the community like i said it's called from 2000, 2019 which is an automation to bring a simplex all-in-one installation for you up in virtualbox and we uh, did all the fixes and reduced to five steps currently those are the five steps it's it's going to be less than five uh, after we finish this, but uh, with these five steps on any uh, Debian box, uh, Debian based uh, operating system, you can get a fully working and running Starling X all in one simplex installation using VirtualBox. So it's all copy and paste. There is no need to uh, to to adjust any of the comments. It's, it's, it's just copy paste to your terminal and the installation is going to do all the things. This is a, a, a sped up, a speed up video of me installing. You see a lot of windows popping up right there, but that's because I was uh, kind of explaining uh, uh, what was happening. This was, uh, I, I think I did for myself, but at some point I, I might share with the community as well. But at the end, you get a fully working installation. It takes a little bit of time. It takes, you know, on my computer, for example, it takes one hour. It's always one hour and a few seconds. One hour, one minute, one hour, 30 seconds, something like that. Uh, but you don't have to touch anything. Uh, Windows will pop up sometimes, VirtualBox. We are working on a headless version that doesn't bring up anything. Uh, but it's going to do all the things for you. At the end, you're gonna have a solution fully working. So you get your hands dirty uh, right at the beginning. That's the whole idea. Uh, uh, the whole idea is to, to see something working for yourself where you have control. You can, uh, you can then proceed to continue learning about the, 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 the tool. And we are, what we are working on is pretty much all the other installation methods that are available. Uh, I'm, this is me trying to make a joke, but honestly, this is not going to, to be very hard. Uh, uh, there is a lot of code to review. There is a lot of code to, to, to uh, kind of bring back to life. There is code to delete as well. I hope to, uh, my hope is to have in three months like a metric that I deleted more code than I created. That's my goal. <laughs> and and uh, at the same time, of course, bringing something to that's working in the community. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot uh, here, but I don't think it's gonna be that hard to make all those things work because they are variations of the same. Uh, like Bruce uh, showed, they are other variations of the installation. And if I remember correctly, I think the Kubernetes setup here, I think we already have something up. It's not up for review yet, but I remember seeing some code from Daniel on, on my team uh, about this. Uh, so I think we are going to get Kubernetes also working on the AIO Simplex installation. Uh, that's why we have a lot of reviews open right now. Uh, and Cora, yeah, uh, I'm the one talking, but I'm part of a team of uh, five. So Bruno, Daniel, Douglas, Lindley, and Tomas. Uh, I do most of the talking. They do most of the work. That's how it works. Just kidding. I do love to get my hand dirty, like I said. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they work harder than I do. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And that was all. The, uh, let's do a quick recap here. Uh, you have all the links now. You have everything that you need to orient yourself within the community. Uh, you know, or hopefully know where the code is. You hopefully know how to reach people and when to reach people in the community. You hopefully know how to push your changes now in Garrett 
uh, which is different from what most developers are used to, but I can guarantee it's kind of even better than what most developers are used to. And hopefully in a few weeks, you can pick, quickly get a Starling X set up locally with the, uh, this, the module script that we are working on. Right now you can go there to the reviews that we have open and download the patch set that we have and use it for yourself, it is possible. I myself did this installation with the, the setup that we, the script that we modified like, I don't know, more than 10 times already and it's working almost flawlessly. Uh, there's way more things to do, but you already can get a uh, starting X working quickly. And that's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, you had one question in the chat asking, uh, do you know how many core reviewer, active core reviewers are reachable at one time? How many, come again? Core reviewers are reachable at one time? I don't know. I do know that there is a simple way to know who are the core reviewers. If you go here, where, is, where am I? So most of the core reviewers are on the East Coast of the US. There's a couple in other places, but uh, not, there used to be more in uh, Asia Pacific time zone, but right now most are on the East Coast US. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, you can get the car reviews from browsing here on the groups and then finding a group that uh, resembles the name of the repository you were working on, working on. It's going to show you all the car reviewers of that uh, particular group. Actually, I can put a link in the chat that shows where. So the the cores are actually stored in the um, infrastructure itself. So. If you go, I'll put this link in the chat. If you go to this link and then look at a specific project, then there's a link on that project page that says members, and that gets you the core reviewers for any of the projects. Awesome. Perfect. Um, are there any other questions for Bruno or even for Bruce still? I actually have one question more for the audience. I'm curious, because this is a pretty introductory, like meet up to Starling X. I'm mean, curious to know for the folks who are listening in, are you new to Starling X? Are you already contributing to it? Are you just trying to learn more? Kind of where are people in their journey with Starling X? Want to comment or unmute yourself? I'd be interested to know. We have one said new, trying to learn more. Okay, cool. Well, I hope it was helpful. I mean, I'm not a very technical person. I'm more on the community and marketing side, and I found this very interesting to kind of learn more and what the developers are doing. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. And I'll get this also uploaded and posted to the Open Infra uh, Foundation's YouTube channel. So I'll add all the links that were mentioned by Bruce and Bruno as well to that comment of that video too if you need to find those. Perfect. Well, there's nothing awesome. else. I think we can close out for the evening or the morning or wherever you are right now. <laughs> and um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me or Bruce or Bruno. We'll be happy to answer them and I hope to see you guys all soon. Thank you see guys. You guys soon. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Bye.